um, welcome to the latest of our talks um, this afternoon, uh, which is about the um, apocryphal society, but the, the, yeah, the society of apocryphal or um, the apocryphal hall. Um, so, Anna, tell us a bit about yourself while some people still pile in. Um, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you all very much for joining this afternoon's webinar. I'm looking forward to talking to you about the Society of Apothecaries, um, which is something that I wrote my PhD on almost 20 years ago, and an institution I'm still involved with today as I work as their um, history course director for their History of Medicine course, which is a course that runs over 15 Saturdays a year in the, in the autumn through to the spring. And um, we have a mixture of people on that course. Um, I've written extensively about the Society of Apothecaries in my time, and um, I will be um, talking about some aspects of the hall today, particularly about its laboratory um, and the drugs that were manufactured there from 1672 up until 1922. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, um... Let me just say that uh, we have Anna Simmons here um, talking to us about pill powders and purgative, the story of how drugs from a London library company were used throughout the world. Sound gripping. Anna, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, do you want to just let the last couple of people in before I start? Well, it won't be the last couple, but just, right. just, just carry on. All right. OK, I will. I will carry on now. Thank you all very much for joining this afternoon's webinar. Today I'll be talking about the City of London Livery Company, the Society of Apothecaries, and the story of how drugs manufactured at its premises in Blackfriars were used throughout the world. Within sight of St Paul's Cathedral, amongst the office-lined streets of the City of London, passers-by may notice an entrance above which there is an impressive coat of arms. Behind the courtyard doors, there is a fine example of a livery company hall dating from the late 17th century. However, what is perhaps more surprising is to discover what happened on this site for 250 years. From 1672 until 1922, the Society of Apothecaries operated a pharmaceutical trade from its premises at Apothecaries Hall, Blackfriars. While members of the livery company were engaged in ceremonial, civic and social functions in the society's splendid Great Hall, in the area adjacent and below it, drugs were manufactured and packaged for delivery throughout Britain and its empire. From the heart of the City of London, drugs such as aloe pills, powdered Peruvian bark and the purgative calomel were sent to places as near as St Bartholomew's Hospital and as distant as Australia. This year sees the 350th anniversary of the opening of a laboratory for manufacturing chemical medicines at Apothecaries Hall. It is also 100 years since its closure in 1922. The history of the laboratory and its associated drug trade will be the focus of today's webinar. With its creation rooted in the burgeoning popularity of chemical medicines and the ongoing disputes with the College of Physicians, the laboratory and associated manufacturing premises expanded during the 18th century, as the Society of Apothecaries became a supplier of medicines to customers, including hospitals, government, the Navy and the East India Company. In the 19th century, under the direction of the chemists William Brand, Henry Hennell and Robert Warrington, new directions of research and consultancy developed. Whilst the Society of Apothecaries struggled to reconcile its new role as a medical licensing corporation with that of a wholesale drug manufacturer. Meaning by derivation warehouseman or storekeeper, apothecaries were originally aligned with pepperers and spices in terms of products. Over time, their specialised skills in buying, preparing, and retailing drugs set them apart. By the late 14th century, the apothecary's trade in London was controlled by the wealthy grocer's company. Apothecary shops were concentrated in and around Butlersbury, a short street near Cheapside in the city, which barely exists today. 
However, following the foundation of the College of Physicians in 1518, increasingly the college sought control over the apothecaries as well. By the start of the 17th century, they were subject to the authority of these two disparate groups, but they had little power to irregulate themselves and protect the integrity of their trade. Apothecaries were recognised as a distinct group in the grocer's re-granted 1606 charter, but their subservience remained. Demands for self-governance started soon after, supported by Gideon de Lorne, Royal Apothecary, and Theodore Turquie de Mayenne, Royal Physician. The apothecaries formally separated from the grocer's company in 1617. Under the terms of the Royal Charter granted by James I, the new livery company was governed by a court of assistants. With a master and wardens at its head, the court's initial composition reflected the strong links with the Royal Court and the College of Physicians, which lay behind the society's formation. In the next section of this talk, I will look at the background and foundation of the laboratory belonging to the Society of Apothecaries. Adding a productive element to the institution's activities was considered shortly after foundation. The dispensary was planned to produce epidemical medicines in 1623, and later a laboratory by the waterside was proposed, but neither project came to fruition. However, the early 1670s were an opportune time, both politically and practically, for the society to move into drug production. The College of Physicians Laboratory had been destroyed in the Great Fire of London, whilst there was a lull in activity from the Society of Chemical Physicians after their numbers decreased during the plague. With the Society of Apothecaries rebuilding its own premises after the Great Fire of London, this provided an opportunity to incorporate the laboratory. As the economic historian Patrick Wallace has highlighted, the 17th century saw a massive growth in the volume of drugs imported into England and major expansion in the consumption of medicines. Apothecaries were one of the key groups of practitioners involved in their processing and supply. Constructing a laboratory, therefore, built on society members' existing mercantile interests. They also no doubt recognised the potential for financial gains from medicines produced under corporate oversight. On the 8th of September 1671, the minutes of the Society's governing body, the Court of Assistants, record the initial order that the laboratory be erected and finished. The laboratory became operational in January 1672 and formal orders for its governance were agreed. Financed by £100 from the Society and subscriptions ranging from £5 to £25 from 61 members, the laboratory's initial purpose was to produce chemical medicines. From amongst the subscribers, a management committee was appointed to administer the laboratory. A treasurer was elected to deal with its finances, and auditors were selected to monitor its activities. As an incentive to invest, subscribers were able to purchase drugs manufactured in the laboratory for use in their own businesses at a substantial discount. Apothecaries Hall was a place of purchase as well as production. A designated retail space for chemical medicines was part of the establishment from the start, with an apothecary placed in charge of the shop and a price catalogue produced. The vault under the Society's Great Hall was enclosed to house the new laboratory, with a chemical operator given responsibility for manufacturing chemical medicines. Elected by the Court of Assistants and subject to its authority, the chemical operator was a member of the society known to be skillful and experienced in this act of pharmacy. There were, however, exceptions made to this requirement of membership. One of the society's early chemical operators was Nicholas Staphorst, who held the post from six, around 1676 until his death in 1701. Staphorst instructed the physician and collector Hans Sloan in the preparation and use of chemical medicines, while Sloan lodged with him in the house adjoining the Hall Laboratory in 1679. Staphorst published Officina Chemica Londinensis in 1685. This publication consisted of brief preparation methods for some 360 chemical medicines produced in the Hall Laboratory. Translated as London's Chemical Workshop, 
the title chosen perhaps suggests its position within London's productive culture to which Stackhorse aspired. Production soon expanded beyond the manufacture of chemical medicines. An extensive trade developed during the 18th century, supplying all types of medicines to a wide range of customers. These customers included individual medical practitioners, numerous hospitals and various government organisations. The trade operated through two joint stock companies, the Navy stock and the laboratory stock, in which only members of the society could purchase shares. These members were also responsible for administering the trade through various committees. Following the award of a monopoly of drug supply in 1703, the British Navy became the whole trade's most important customer. Soon after, the society started supplying drugs to the East India Company. On visiting London in 1710, the German scholar, bibliophile and traveller Zacharias Konrad von Uffenbach described the chemical laboratory at Apothecary's Hall as the largest and best. However, he did not consider all of the hall's premises so highly, going on to complain that the Galenicum is very small and wretched, and so is the Apothecary's shop. Nevertheless, he continued, it is however excellent that they have here public laboratories where not only are medicines prepared for their ships and hospitals, but also most of the apothecaries obtain their preparations afterwards mixing and dispensing them. As the manufacturing operation located at and around Apothecary's Hall grew, drugs were produced in bulk quantities and supplied throughout Britain and its empire. In addition to the Navy and East India Company, customers included numerous London hospitals and institutions, medical practitioners, merchants shipping drugs to the West Indies, and the Hudson's Bay Company. Demand expanded further when the society obtained a monopoly in 1766 to supply all of the East India Company's drug requirements. As a result of the Naval and East India contracts, the haul drugs were used by the East India Company's army, at the Royal Navy Hospitals in Greenwich, Plymouth and Haslar, in surgeons' chests from the, New from the Newfoundland to the West to the East Indies, they would be found in medicine chests on board ships in the First Fleet to Australia and during the Seven Years' War and the American War of Independence. Although the haul trade's fortunes fluctuated during the 18th century, the increased demand for drugs during times of conflict made profits rise sharply. For example, shareholders received annual dividends of up to 40% of their invested capital during the war with France in the 1790s. These trends are illustrated on this graph of the value of dividends paid out on a £200 share in the Navy stock over the period from 1780 to 1800. By the late 18th century, the laboratory space was no longer adequate to meet the demands of bulk drug contracting. This led to a period of continuous expansion in the Apothecary's Hall in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Within these improvements, encompassing developments in chemistry, increasing manufacturing capacity, and producing high quality drugs in bulk directed the changes undertaken. A brief summary illustrates how quickly drug production at Apothecary's Hall was expanding. Completed by February 1782, there was now a still house, a magnesia laboratory, a laboratory for sorts, and a new chemical laboratory on land at the east of the hall. There was also a mortar house, warehouse accommodation, and housing for employees. When the German chemist Johann Friedrich August Guttling visited Apothecary's Hall in the late 1780s, he described two large laboratories, a still house and hand mill room, and highlighted how all chemical preparations are prepared in large quantities. The rapid expansion of manufacturing premises at Apothecary's Hall continued for the first two decades of the 19th century. In 1801, land was acquired adjoining the hall for a mill house, initially horsepower that enabled large quantities of drugs to be ground on site. In 1814 to 15, a state-of-the-art still house was constructed. 
This was illustrated in Anthony Todd Thompson's London Dispensatory and was significant for the new steam laboratory it incorporated. The final phase of laboratory development began with the acquisition in 1822 of the lease of a former foundry backing onto the society's property to the east. The following year, over £14,500 was invested in both new and existing facilities. This included the great laboratory on the foundry site and improvements to the mill house, steam engine, high pressure boiler and warehouses. There was also a new retail shop, steam boiler and apparatus. The mill house now contained an eight horsepower steam engine, which powered machinery for grinding drugs. The expansion coincided with a major reorganization of the trade structure. In the 18th century, the society's pharmaceutical trade had been operated by two stock companies, the Navy stock and the laboratory stock. In 1822, these entities were dissolved and a new stock company, the United Stock, formed. In its productive heyday during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the Society of Apothecaries had an unrivaled capacity in London to process and manufacture huge quantities of drugs. In an emergency, it claimed to be able to supply an army of 30,000 men with all its drug requirements in only 10 days. The society's customers certainly required drugs to be supplied in bulk. For example, the East India Company needed drugs for an army of over 100,000 men and also for ships, hospitals and trading posts. However, the society's service to the East India Company was not restricted to drug supply. It refitted medicine chests for company ships, such as the Buckinghamshire and Scalaby Castle, and supplied their medical sundries, such as bedpans, sponges and stomach pumps, although it did not manufacture these items itself. The East India Company's requirements were undoubtedly extensive. Over 600 items that the company could choose to order from were listed on an indent which survives in the archives at Apothecaries Hall. The volume covers 1827 to 1828, and is divided into three sections, drugs, galenicals and chemicals. The quantity of each item sent to different destinations is then specified. And the next slide shows a page from this volume. It shows that during 1827 to 1828, almost 37,000 pounds of the laxative magnesium sulfate, better known as Epsom salts, were sent out to India no doubt highlighting the digestive issues faced by some of the British working out there. Out of an estimated total trade workforce of between 50 and 60 during the 1820s, the laboratories were staffed by a chemical operator, a foreman, between eight and ten workmen, and until 1826, a glenical operator. Manufacturing work was strenuous, with the laboratory workmen spending hours stirring vats, grinding large quantities of drugs or monitoring processes. The remaining trade employees worked in the surrounding warehouses, packing rooms and offices. In the committee rooms, members of the society decided which raw materials to purchase and set the sale price of drugs produced. Meanwhile, in the counting house, bills were sent out and accounts settled. Nearby, the warehouses and packing rooms contained boxes of drugs piled high ready for dispatch. Packing drugs was not an easy task when dealing with large quantities and specific customer requirements. One customer, the Crown Agents of the Colonies, required its drugs be packaged in small amounts ready for immediate use. For example, an order sent to Ceylon in the late 19th century contained over 13,000 packages. Not all of the trade's customers placed such substantial orders. At various points during the 19th century, relative, relatively small quantities of drugs were supplied to a hospital in Mauritius, a convict establishment in Tasmania, and for an expedition to the Niger. 
However, the trade's financial success depended primarily on significant government orders. In 1842, the society's customer base grew further when it began supplying drugs to the British Army. During the Crimean War, increased military demand led turnover to peak at over £100,000 per annum. A similar level of demand arose when the East India Company's requirements increased dramatically around the time of the Indian Rebellion. For the haul trade, times of conflict for the nation brought prosperity for its stock company's shareholders. The top bright blue line on this graph shows the total turnover of the haul trade for the years from 1850 to 1870. Demand from the Navy, which is the pink line, remained fairly constant, with requirements from the East India Company and later the India Office, shown on the yellow line, and the Army, the dark blue line, fluctuating significantly according to their military action. In 1856, an evocative description of the Hall Laboratories appeared in Household Words, the weekly magazine edited by Charles Dickens. The article described where great millstones powder rhubarb, enormous stills silently do their work, and coppers all heated by steam are full of costly juices from all corners of the world. In the private laboratory, the most delicate scientific tests and processes were employed for the purposes of trade by a skillful chemist. With warehouses and packing rooms heaped up with boxes of drugs to be sent out by the next ship to India. In this next section, I'm going to look at some of the other chemical activities taking place at the Apothecaries Hall Laboratories in the 19th century, notably in education, research and consultancy. In the early 19th century, another function was added to the society's remit when it gained new responsibilities in medical licensing following the Apothecaries Act of 1815. This new role was highlighted in the article from Household Words, which took the reader from the manufacturing premises to the examination room, where one may perhaps see the young medical students deep in the agonies of an examination to prove they have been educated as become those who are to join a liberal profession. Crucially at this point, the interplay of its various functions became more complex. The society was tainted by the stigma of trade with protests appearing in the Lancet that medical practitioners were being examined by a contemptible gang of retail druggists. As the society tried to respond to such attacks and also balance the interests of its various remits, it used its laboratories to enhance its reputation. The pamphlet shown on this slide, the origin, progress and present state of the various establishments for conducting chemical processes and other medicinal preparations at Apothecaries Hall, was published by the Society of Apothecaries in 1823 to publicise its manufacturing activities and demonstrate its scientific credentials. It included a description of the laboratories written by the chemist William Thomas Brand, a multiple post holder in 19th century London. Through his position as a society superintending chemical operator, Brand oversaw the improvements to the Hall Laboratories in the 1810s and 20s that have just been discussed. He was also Professor of Chemistry at the Royal Institution from 1813 to 52, lectured at various medical schools and the London Institution, and held a series of appointments at the Mint. He was the Society's Professor of Chemistry and Materia Medica from 1813 to 52 and delivered lectures on topics including chinchona and purgatives. Another important source of income for Brand was consulting. This work included advising London water and oil gas companies, providing expert chemical testimony in court, and undertaking analyses of saltpetre, a key commodity imported by the East India Company. In addition to Brand, two other chemists and fellows of the Royal Society are significant to the history of the Hall Laboratories in the 19th century. Henry Hennell had worked in the Hall Laboratory since the beginning of his apprenticeship in 1814. On gaining his freedom, he was appointed chemical operator in 1821. 
elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1829, Hennel is best known for his discovery of sulfur vinic acid, known as ethyl sulfuric acid. This work was fundamental to later studies in organic synthesis, as it involved the production of ethanol from ethylene and sulfuric acid. Alongside Michael Faraday, Hennel was a member of the City Philosophical Society and active on the Chemical Committee of the Society of Art. Hennel worked for the Society of Apothecaries until his life was tragically cut short when he attempted to make the explosive mercury fulminate in the front courtyard at the hall. The explosive was required by one of the hall trade's most important customers, the East India Company. Its army used the detonating powder to prime small copper caps in muzzle-loading firearms. Supplies were usually obtained from the Channel Island of Guernsey, where production took place due to the low price of alcohol. However, in 1842, there were problems sourcing sufficient quantities in time to make the shipment to India. When only three pounds of mercury fulminate could be purchased, against Brown's advice, Hennel decided to undertake manufacture himself. By working in a relatively small quantities and in the open air in the front courtyard at Apothecary's Hall, Hennel believed he was taking sufficient precautions. However, mercury fulminate is highly sensitive to friction, heat and shock, and although production had progressed satisfactorily on the Friday, on the Saturday morning an awful explosion occurred. Hennel was in the process of mixing two separate portions of the moist powder in a china bowl with an ivory knife, when the whole quantity, amounting to above six pounds, exploded, and he was killed instantly. Hennel's successor was Robert Warrington, a central figure in the mid 19th century chemical community. He is best known for his role in the foundation of the Chemical Society of London in 1841, the oldest of the predecessor societies of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Following a period working for the brewers Truman Hanbury and Braxton, Warrington was employed as a chemical operator from 1842 to 1866. Warrington utilised the status and infrastructure provided by his employment at Apothecary's Hall to develop a lucrative career in chemical consulting, with industrial and commercial clients, including the South London dye stuff manufacturers, Simpson, Moore and Nicholson. His professional engagements also involved work as a chemical referee for gas companies, in water analysis, as a scientific advisor in law courts, and revising and editing the London and British pharmacopoeias. Eustace Liebig and Robert Warrington had a close friendship, with Liebig sending Warrington a dozen bottles of genuine wine wine and writing, Regarding myself, I like London perhaps more than any other place. I have in this town so many friends, among whom, my dear Warrington, you are one of those I most esteem. And we're now coming on to the concluding section of this talk, which is going to look at the final years of the pharmaceutical trade at the Society of Apothecaries until its closure in 1922. The prosperity experienced during the 1850s would not continue for much longer. In 1870, the Hall trade lost its important monopoly with the British Navy, and by the end of the decade, orders from the India office had dwindled away to nothing. The position of the Society of Apothecaries as a manufacturing livery company located in the City of London was increasingly anachronistic. Moreover, its remit as a medical licensing corporation was further removed from its manufacturing role. With the foundation of the Pharmaceutical Society in 1841, its regulatory and professional roles in pharmacy were also eclipsed. Drugs were increasingly purchased from other suppliers and sold on, rather than manufactured at the hall. Changes in chemical, therapeutic and medical practice, the high cost of its products, and growing competition from other pharmaceutical firms, all had a major impact on the viability of the hall pharmaceutical trade. Furthermore, the conservative nature of the society and its management impeded any effective change to administrative or business practices. Its members, meanwhile, now primarily general practitioners, had little interest in running a trade to supply themselves with medicines. Following a loss of just under a thousand pounds in 1879, 
The following year, the United stock was dissolved by its proprietors. When the laboratories were inspected in 1881, the old furnace rooms, mortar room, magnesia room were all unused. It appears that only the still house and the mill house were functional, and many of the warehouses, storerooms and cellars were surplus to requirements. Along with outdated apparatus, old and unnecessary stores accumulated during and since the Crimean War, almost 30 years previously, had been left untouched. However, the end of the United Stock did not lead to the closure of the society's pharmaceutical trade. A major reorganisation followed, with production continuing on a smaller scale. The Great Laboratory was cleared and used as a wholesale department, while unused trade premises were let to tenants and a warehouse converted into examination halls. Drug supply was focused on a niche market of primarily public service customers, such as the Crown Agents of the Colonies, who were prepared to pay elevated prices for the society's guarantee of quality and high level of customer service. Orders placed by the Crown agents meant that drug supplies were sent from Blackfriars to Nigeria, the Gold Coast, British Honduras, Barbados, Tehran and the Seychelles. Despite the reorganisation, many underlying problems persisted. An external report commissioned by the Society in 1914 described the trade as more a question of sentiment than a commercial proposition. The balance of the society's functions shifted yet again during the First World War, and it struggled even more to adapt to changing trading conditions. However, despite a strike by workers in May 1920, the society's governing body stalled from making a final decision. It was not until a substantial loss was made that it was agreed in February 1922 to close the wholesale and retail trades as soon as possible. On the 13th of April 1922, the retail department at Apothecaries Hall closed permanently. Commenting on this closure, a correspondent from the Times wrote how this deprives Londoners of a pleasant privilege and an opportunity to escape from the 20th century into more leisured days. The retail department's assets included prescription books, formulae, proprietary articles and goodwill. They were sold to Messrs Cooper's Son & Co, dispensing chemists from Gloucester Road of London, for the sum of just over a thousand pounds. The wholesale trade closed to customers on May 1922, 100 years ago yesterday. In the following weeks, the works finished operating and stock taking took place. Randall and Wilson, wholesale druggist from Southampton, purchased the famous process book of pure drugs and the goodwill of the wholesale trade for the small sum of 50 pounds. Stocks of drugs were sold to customers at a discount and whatever remained in terms of stock and plant was purchased for 350 pounds by Morton's Cash Chemists of London. When the closure of the wholesale business was reported in the Times, it was noted that in addition to being a medical licensing body, the society has carried on business for centuries as a wholesale and retail druggists and possessed its own prescriptions, formulae and special preparations. Another article in the same edition commented that the famous process book of the pure drugs has now changed hands. With this, the society thus closes its three centuries of trading activity, and with them a record as proud as any in the history of medicine. When looking closely at the exterior of Apothecaries Hall today, it is still possible to find signs of its trading past. The impressive coat of arms above the courtyard's entrance originally hung outside the retail shop. The magnesia room also remains intact, albeit with offices now inside, and on close inspection, a flower trough in the courtyard can be identified as a lead cistern from the laboratories. Inside, there is a wealth of archival material related to its trading and other activities. Whilst the apothecary shop functions as an event space, affectionately known to members as the Champagne Bar. This all serves as a reminder that for 250 years, the laboratories at Apothecaries Hall 
produce drugs that were used by people all the way from Blackfriars to Barbados and beyond. Um, and thank you all very much for listening to that. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. And just at the end, I'd also like to add a few thanks to the Society of Apothecaries and its archive, which have given me great support in accessing its collections and also providing many of the images today. And also to the Royal Society of Chemistry Library, the Rothamsted Library, the Wellcome Library and the British Library for archives and images used in this talk. If anyone is interested in reading more about um, the Society of Apothecaries, its laboratories and also apothecaries activities in general, um, some of the themes I've talked about today are covered in a special article collection from Ambix and the Annal of Science, which this accompanied a symposium I organised at Apothecaries Hall earlier this month. And until the end of July 2022, you can access the, these articles without charge from the link on this um, overhead. Um, it tells us lots about chemistry, medicine and laboratories from the 17th to the 19th centuries, and it's all put together to tie in with the 350th anniversary of the opening of the first laboratory at Apothecaries Hall. And with that, I shall end and hand back to Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna, and a fascinating talk. I mean, one wonders if things could have turned out differently if, for example, the business of Apocalypse Hall could have been commercialised in some way, but in a way we can't really do that what happened is what happened and uh, you know we just have to <laughs> well it's interesting you say that peter because um tilly tansley and i are hoping to look at some of the work in physiological drug standardization that took place at apothecaries hall in the very early 20th century um and sort of why that didn't come to anything so um that's sort of one of my next projects on the um that's hopefully going to be on the go soon but they, they did because of the sort of unique um connections between pharmacy and medicine and a number of the people that were active there at the hall in the early 20th century who worked in physiological standardization there were some quite interesting projects but they did a bit of work there and they standardized drugs for um companies such as Boots and May and Baker before they had registered laboratories, um, but this all sort of then disappeared in the course of the First World War. So that's the another story, th though. The other thing that struck me toward the end of the talk is that it, it made a decline in the 1880s and 1890s, coincided with a great interest in the development of theory, you know, like anti rabies theory and vaccines and so on and led to the formation of the Lister Institute. So it's interesting how it also reflected to some degree a trip in the interest in medicine at the time. Oh yeah, it, it definitely does. And I think that's why, um, along with Tilly Tansy, we're quite, I'm quite interested in exploring this period at its end of its trade a bit, a bit more closely, because there's definitely shifts happening in the pharmaceutical production at that place, and it's all, it's all ties into those. Yeah. I have one question. Um, which in fact we might want to um, generalise a bit. The question particularly was, what is a Galenicum? But um, I think if you could just say a little bit about Galenicals in general, I think some people might be interested, but I think we're a bit, some people are a bit confused. What are Galenicals and against ordinary? No, no, that's fine. I did expect that might be a question. I'm just going to stop. Um, are you happy if I stop sharing my screen so you can actually sure, speak? Absolutely, that's fine. That's fine. Right. I'll just do that so you can see me properly now. So, yes, uh, Galenicum is does get quite confusing. When they started manufacturing at Pothecaries Hall, they just started with chemical medicines. Um, but soon afterwards, when they started supplying the Navy, they needed Galenical medicines as well. And basically at this time, um, manufacture was split between chemical and clinical production and chemical production generally referred to things that needed chemical methods like distillation and um, digestion to take place and to involve in involving production. Galenicals tended to be plant-based medicines and there was a slide in my um, presentation which did summarize that briefly and basically when you've got the beginning of the 18th century because the society is only just starting making galenicals which it needs to do this to supply the navy it doesn't have very good facilities for doing that over the course of the 18th century the laboratory under the great hall gets split between chemical and glenical production they actually have separate people to do each role one makes one chemical operator who works in the chemical section of the laboratory and a glenical operator who works in the glenical section. And actually, when the laboratory gets inspected by the 
um, Royal College of Physicians in the middle of the 18th century, they actually discuss what happens on the right and the left side of the hall, and that corresponds to the chemical manufacture, which is generally things like acids um, and preparations that could still be plant based, but they were using chemical methods like distillation to make them. And it is quite a complicated thing. And there's a very good article by Marika Hendrickson, which appeared in Ambix, which is actually in the article collection, where she sort of goes into a lot more detail as to what lies behind this distinction in 18th century medicine. And the, the actually the other thing I should just add is the society are actually quite unusual to still be using it in the early 19th century, because by that point, most of it's um, fallen out of use. And that's why they abolished the post of clinical operator in 1826. Alan Dunfield has just asked a question. What do the apocryphy do now? Do they still examine? Um, they still examine. They have a range of diplomas. Um, they don't, until relatively recently, they still examine medical practitioners. So when I was doing my PhD about 20 years ago, um, they still you could still get a license from the site of apothecaries, um, but it was mostly people from overseas that got those licenses. Nowadays, they are a City of London livery company, so they have all the usual um, functions of a livery company, um, but they also um, do various diplomas, including things like HIV medicine, um, medical jurisprudence, and the diploma that I'm involved in running the course for, which is in the history of medicine, a diploma in philosophy. Um, and they've also got a very active faculty of the history and philosophy of medicine, which of all organises events and lectures. And I think they sort of see themselves as a space where people interested in the humanities and medicine and history can all come together. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. And um, your answer to those questions uh, added extra value to the talk. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we enjoyed it very much. Several people have said so. And... Um, we well, thank you for for doing that. Can I oh, give for my? Sorry, I say that's my pleasure. It's been lovely talking to everyone, and lovely to see um, some familiar names on the um, on the list of attendees. Thank you all very much for listening and listening to me this afternoon. Well, Geraldine, Geraldine was in. She came. Geraldine Roberts was here. Yeah, no, she said she might. Geraldine was my old um, was my old supervisor, who will have heard a certain amount of in terms of the time I did my PhD, rather than an age. Sorry, Jerry, um, but yes, she's so she's very familiar with a lot of the things I've talked about today. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to next week when Peter Van Berg will be giving us a talk about chemistry in the nineteenth century, which kind of ties in to some extent with what you've been talking about there, Anna. And um, next month, we'll be having a talk about chemical uh, forgeries and basically chemistry and art by Abiba Bernstock from the Court Order Institute. So uh, more details of that will go out in the next year alert and in the next round robin to the regular attendees. And please, please continue attending our talk. It's good to see such high numbers. We had 73 people today. So that's very good, considering many people are now back at work. So once again, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much, Anna, for speaking, and goodbye for now. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for listening. Bye.